And welcome to Good Shepherd United Methodist Church. Cheryl's not here this week. She's got a lovely staycation. Are you having trouble hearing, Bill? Yes. Is the mic on? No. It's on. Okay. Use your outdoor voice. All right. I will use my outdoor voice. Okay. On Tuesday at 9.45, there's a chair exercise class. Wednesday morning for the ladies doing the book study, there is no class this week. Um, why don't you all check your thumbs? Don't suppose any of you have any green thumbs. That's all right. We don't need them. We need volunteers to help take care of these front flower beds and the flower beds, weeding them. I'm going to be up here to, uh, throughout the week messing around up here because I like playing in the dirt. Um, we are collecting for Dorcas Heart, and those are mostly hygiene items, not in trial size, but in regular size products. It's in our bulletin what we need. And we're, we're also collecting for the summer needs for the food pantry, which is on the sheet right here, and you'll see both needs right there. Um, is there anything else anybody can think of that needs to be announced? Okay. I do have two more announcements. Second Sunday is going to be at Ellen's this, this June 12th. Sign-up sheet is on the back table. And also, if nobody has known it, the, la the last classroom down on the left is being converted into um, Cheryl's office and Rebecca's office down there. This office back here, Will be the wall will be taken down, be made one room, and it'll be more like a conference room. So that's coming up in the future, also. Four classes. Four classes. Four both. Wait, I gotta write it down. <laughs> Lord's prayer, Lord's prayer, Lord's prayer. All right. Um, anyway, uh, it is Memorial Day weekend, and a time when we can all enjoy a little extra fun. Um, if you're like us and have a pool, you probably have people who are coming over because they called and asked. <laughs> No, it's family, and as, uh, it's a good time. But uh, anyway, 
uh, be careful of the heat out there. It's getting ugly again. So let's stand and sing our first hymn, Great is the Lord. to worship. We gather today because we are called to worship together. We, we are, are where, where God, God wants, wants us, us to be. be. No matter where we go, no matter what we endure, God, God is, is using us in kingdom, kingdom building ways. ways. We gather today because we are called, oh. I'm sorry. Even if we feel trapped or lost, a way has been made for us to find another path or to bloom where we have been planted. Let, Let us worship God. God. We give thanks, God Almighty, for the life, teachings, sacrifice, and resurrection of your Son. We continue to be guided by all that Christ stood for in his life and ours. It is through him that we can come before you as we continue to live the life he has given us. We give thanks, God Almighty, for your ascended son. We continue to live our, lift our eyes to the heavens while our hearts and minds remain focused on what lies below. It is through your Son that we can strengthen the lives to live a faith of, in this world. We pray for Dawn and Daryl, Tammy, Julie, Joe, and Alessandra as they continue their cancer treatments. Be with them to give them strength and the peace of your presence. We are thankful for the miracle of Norman's recovery and pray, pray he continues to heal. We are thank, thankful that Bodhi is recovering from his last, latest chemo and has returned home. We praise your presence with Ron as he begins to recover. Be with him in his recovery and give him patience and strength. Be with all these families and friends and give them the courage and compassion to be these people in their, with these people in their journey. We thank you for Sarah's recovery from her liver transplant. Be with her and give her strength in body and mind and in spirit. Be with Jerry as he grows in strength. We thank you for Chris's great progress in therapy as a result of a car accident. Be with Caitlin in new things and be with Karen in her progress. We pray for comfort and peace for Jackie and for Pat. We pray especially today for those families and children in Uvalde that have survived a very awful event. Give them peace. Help them to sleep. 
help them to recover. They will never forget, but they can return to life. We are with the people in the Ukraine. We pray that the carnage there will stop, that the reason will become invalid, that things will return to normal for them, because normal will take a while. And we pray that it strengthens the entire world and how we should act toward one another that love and lives are more important than power and wealth. We pray for all the unsaid prayers, and we pray that violence may cease, because we can't do it without you. You're the only one that can help us. We give thanks, God Almighty, for the Spirit. We continue to live empowered by the Spirit, sealed in us at our baptism and burning in our hearts. It is through the spirit promised by Christ that we can be emboldened by your love. And now let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day your daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And let's stand and sing softly and tenderly. Watching for 
Paul and his group are still in Macedonia, still preaching and teaching and healing the sick, helping the poor and the oppressed. Luke is sending a strong message with these stories of healing and salvation. He wants us to understand what the kingdom is if it comes to earth. You know, we say in our uh, daily Lord's Prayer that it that uh, may happen in earth as it is in heaven. And we should probably take that a little bit more earnestly, what we're saying. We're, we're saying that we want to see the kingdom of God. And Luke thinks that we should want it too. This week's sermon title is called Disturbing the City. And it's about taking a stand to promote a way of living just like Jesus did. Loving our neighbors, living not to self, but for the wonderful promise of the kingdom of God. So if you think about it, Jesus' ideas, Jesus' intent is not the way of the world. It goes against the status quo. I believe that that's what we're experiencing now, an awakening to the evils of the status quo and the blowback from that awakening. This is what Jesus meant when he said to Paul that he would know what it was to suffer for the sake of Jesus' name, to suggest a way that is against how it is, is always subversive. It's not so much about whether one good idea is good and one idea is bad, as much as it is about the change from one idea to another idea. And we are certainly stiff-necked people. So we're going to read today about what Paul does in these new scriptures and how he works this into it. So I'm reading from Acts 16, 16 through uh, 34. One day, as we were going to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners a great deal of money by fortune-telling. While she followed Paul and us, she would cry out, These men are slaves of the Most High God who proclaim to you a way of salvation. She kept doing this for many days. But Paul, very much annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I order you to come in the name of Jesus Christ out of her. And it came out in that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. When they had brought them before the magistrates, they said, These men are disturbing our city. They are Jews and are advocating customs that are not lawful for us as Roman citizens to adopt or observe. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates had them stripped of their clothing and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After they had given them a severe flogging, they threw them into prison and ordered the jailer to keep them securely. Following these instructions, he put them in the innermost cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was an earthquake so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself since he supposed that all the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted in a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. The jailer called for lights, and rushing in, he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them outside and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They answered, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And that same hour of the night, he took them and washed their wounds. Then he and his entire family were baptized without delay. He brought them up into the house, set food before them, and he and his entire household rejoiced that he had become a believer in God. This is the word of the Lord. All right, so here's two stories in one. We get a bargain this time. The first story is about the healing of the slave girl. And she had a gift of divination. 
He brings her to the wholeness in a way that she has never known before. Her story is really kind of too brief for us to understand who she really was and what her life was like. All we know are the descriptive words that Luke uses. We know she's young because she's a girl. And he, how he knows that she's a slave, I don't know. You know, like, is it, did they dress a particular way? Did they wear something? Did she have a big S on her head like Hester Prim did in uh, uh, Scarlet Letter? You know, did they bark them some way? Did they tattoo them some way? That could be. I contend, though, that he probably didn't know she was a slave girl until the owners show up and gripe about it that that was written after he had already figured out all the story and how he was going to do it. So it's kind of interesting that Paul said he was very much annoyed by this woman. You know, at first you think, well, they got free advertising. But if you think about how, how they did their, uh, their, I hate to call it proselytization, but uh, their, their giving of the, the word, they actually would sit down with people and talk to them and get to know them and ask them about themselves. And, you know, and that's why they would get invited back to have a meal is because they would get to know each other and, and have a great conversation. So, you know, they laughed and they talked and they got to know each other. And they couldn't when she's screaming all the time. So that's why he's annoyed. You know, he's, he's kind of a grouch anyway. I learned that in all the Bible studies I took. I don't know if in, it was in your Bible studies, but he was kind of a grouchy guy. So he probably um, did get a little annoyed. So he yells at the spirit, not at the girl, but at the spirit to come out of her. And I think it's kind of interesting that it takes an hour. <laughs> you know, we always think of that ding, you know, like, uh, you know, all the things that you see on TV, all of a sudden they're all well and everything. It took her an hour. And I, I keep wondering if uh, she, one of the reasons that he knew that there was a spirit in her is because she was somehow had some sort of tick or she, she was in some sort of pain when she was uh, doing her tricks of div, div, divination. Div, 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 and so because of that, you know, maybe she gasped or maybe she doubled over or, may, you know, so maybe she looked like she was in pain. And maybe he was really annoyed at the spirit because the spirit was painful for her. It was hurting her. And they were making money off of her. And this was not right. So because of that, you know, he tells her to get the spirit to get out. And you can imagine that she was exhausted when this was over. So she goes home, take a nap. But her owners find out that she's a very different person than the person they knew before when she gets home. And so they start asking questions. What, are you, you know, what happened? Where, you know, what's going on? And she tells them about this man doing this. So the owners get really unhappy because they've just lost their revenue. So they go to, back to the marketplace. They find Silas and Paul. They grab them. They start yelling before they even leave the marketplace and find the magistrates about how this, these people are uh, subversive, divisive, gonna, you know, make, they're making you do things that are unlawful and they're bad people. And so the crowd's starting to grow and it's getting bigger and bigger. Then they find the magistrates and then tell the magistrates what they do. And at this point, you can find a lot of injustice happening because the magistrates don't ask any questions. You don't hear about them going through any kind of due process. <laughs> you just find out that they have an order to have them stripped so they can be flogged. And they don't even, you know, so there's no arresting them until after the punishment. So they, they, uh, so they do all this stuff. And the reason that the owners give is that these people are teaching them unlawful things. Well, I'm sorry, but the seers that worked in all the temples, the pagan temples, and worked in the marketplaces also drove out demons. So it's not unlawful. That was a lie. It was just something they made up. And, of course, everybody took it as the truth. So not only that, but they didn't even go in there and say, hey, we just lost all our revenue because he ran off her her spirit that you know and she belongs to us and there wasn't anything like that 
It was, oh, no, these people are really subversive and they're teaching you to do things that are unlawful and they're bad people. And they're Jews. And so because of that, they get flogged and thrown in the innermost jail, which is the icky part. You know, it's the old part that's falling apart, has black mold and rats. And they're all bloody from being flogged. This is gross. This is really gross. I mean, this is, this, this for having a girl walk around that's annoying you. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's just a crazy story about all the things that happen here. But, you know, it's kind of interesting that, that the uh, people that the, the owners, I suppose that's me, the people the owners are, uh, are smart enough to not say, you know, she's my property, they did something to her, and now she can't work for us, and we're really mad. And you wonder if that's because maybe there are a lot of slaves in the marketplace, because they're the ones that do the shopping. You know, they're the ones that get all the, the supplies. They're the ones that work for these people that are richer. And so they wouldn't have been looked upon the right way. So they made it a different story about a different thing. Because fear is a really provocative catalyst. If you use fear on a crowd, you're probably going to get them on your side because their first reaction is going to be fear. It's not going to, oh, wait, explain that to me. It's going to be, oh, my gosh, you know, something's happening bad. So they turn on Paul and Silas. And the magistrates didn't help at all. Now, the thing is, in all of this that's going on, it, may, it reminded me of Western movies, you know, where they take somebody and they want to lynch them because they did something wrong or they think they did something wrong. Sometimes it's they think they did something wrong, but they just want to go ahead and lynch them and get it over with. They don't want them to go to trial and they don't want to. And I kept thinking about those old movies and about the the fact that, you know, like, in, what is it, the three, three o'clock to Yuma? where the guy can't even get on the train because they're going to kill him before he can even go to where he's going to have a trial. Because the fact of the matter is, they're, they've all been hurt by this person. They've all known somebody like this. They have all this unrequited hate <laughs> that they are ready to put on somebody. And we do that a lot, you know, when we, we get angry with people. And... I don't know that that's a good or a bad. It just happens. But we do know that there's not any part of this story that has anything about love for humanity in it. We don't have anything about the owners being happy that their uh, slave girl isn't in pain anymore. We don't have anything from the magistrates that say, well, justice needs to be done. Let's do this. We don't have anything in the crowd at all that says, wait a minute, let's hear the story. Explain to me why he did, the, like, tell me what they said. They couldn't have told them what Paul and Silas said because they never heard him. But there is no love there. And all there is is a fear for the status quo being challenged. And that's a very interesting thing because this gospel subverts the status quo, always. You know, if you're talking about uh, let's uh, have an empire and all these things, you know, uh, it doesn't have anything to do with loving your neighbor. It has to be with accumulating wealth for yourself or about power. And so these are the things that are talked about in this very first story. But this very first story leads them to the second story. And the second story is about salvation. So Paul and Silas are sitting in prison probably shooing away the rats, not leaning in the black mold, and probably uh, trying to patch up all their, their wounds. And they're, they start singing and praying. Now, if you were, and I'm sure this, is, this could be attested to by people who are prisoners of war, but one thing you have to do when you're imprisoned or you're captured by something is that you have to keep a good attitude. Because if you get take a bad attitude, it just makes it worse. So probably when they start singing and praying, all the other prisoners are like, what? They're in the innermost part of the jail. That's where all the crying comes 
begging comes from. You know, that's, the, that's what we usually hear from there. I hear singing. So they all start listening. Now, you can imagine that part, part of that lifts the spirits of all the prisoners. And probably, knowing that they were disciples, uh, they are probably praying for everybody. So they it's personal. They're getting it in within themselves. So we have all of this going on, and um, you know that they're starting to feel a little bit better, probably more like uh, unified. So they have to, uh, they, they have all this going on, and then all of a sudden there's this really violent earthquake. Now the interesting thing about the earthquake, there are earthquakes over there all the time. That's not the surprising thing. The surprising thing is that it uh, messes up the jail. Now, you don't hear anything about any other part of the city being messed up, just the jail. And the interesting thing that kind of proves what I'm going to say is that it doesn't say that the shackles broke. It doesn't say that the shackles fell out of the wall. It doesn't say anything. It says they were unfastened. Unfastened. So we understand from what Luke is telling us that God is present and working in this actual thing. That there is something going on here that is a beyond us and has something more to do with what is going on in the whole thing. What's happening to all these people? So we realize that you know they keep singing and they keep praying and they don't run away, which is absolutely amazing. And obviously, the jailer is a heavy sleeper because he slept through the earthquake. <laughs> but when he wakes up, he realizes that the jail is in, in shambles. And not only that, but the prisoners are going to be gone. And what's going to happen to him? Well, he'll probably get the same treatment as the prisoners because he wasn't supposed to do that. So he draws a sword to kill himself. And, of course, Paul yells and says, he was probably mumbling or crying. <laughs> There's where the begging went, came in. And, and he, so he does all that, and Paul yells and says, don't do that, we're all here. Now, you can imagine as a jailer in the Roman Empire, when your jail falls apart, everybody's going to escape. Because people were put there without a trial. They were put there, you know, because they were victims. Of, of what was going on. Not that they didn't do something, but, but that the system just disregarded them after that point. So he is in total shock. He cannot imagine why the prisoners didn't leave. Why wouldn't they leave? This is horrible stuff that's going on. So he you know, goes and, and falls down at the feet of Paul and, and Silas. Now, you can imagine that to get a job as a jailer in the Roman Empire, you had to be tough, you had to follow the rules, and you had to take care of things, regardless of what it was. And so he probably thought a lot about his job. His identity was tied up, just like a lot of other people are. Some of us, you're tied up in the identity of your job. So you have, you have this happen, and you, you don't want to suffer for it. He couldn't get a job as a jailer anymore. He'd have to change, he'd have to change to being a teacher or a sanitary uh, uh, engineer, you know. Uh, and it, so he says, no, I, I want to know what must I do to be saved. This is a miracle that the people are here. He's not even thinking about the earthquake. He's just thinking about the fact that the prisoners aren't there. So you can, you can kind of imagine that, uh, that this, this is something that brings him to a realization that maybe he had in the back of his mind for a while. He probably, he probably put in prison a lot of Christians. So, you know, he, he was well aware of what was going on. But uh, anyway, so, you know, it's, he says, what must I do to be saved? And I found, found that to be kind of um, too knowledgeable about the whole process. And so I was looking up in other commentaries, and, and Derek Weber says, what he was really saying was, I want to be like you were when you were here. 
not afraid, not scared of anything, courageous and confident in what's going on. Of course, what they say is, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. They did that a lot back then. They saved the whole household by being saved. And they, tell, and they tell the household about the love of Christ and the salvation of God, and of course they're baptized. And the jailer's identity changes. He changes from being just a jailer to now being a believer. And that makes all the difference. His behavior will reflect his change of heart. Maybe he'll start caring for his prisoners or advocating for their lives or better conditions because he understands that He's supposed to love his neighbor. That is part of his new identity. His behavior as a jailer will disturb the city. All of a sudden, people will say, hey, I want to go to that guy's jail because they have better meals and it's clean there and whatever. So it's not going to, his life is not going to be the same. The lives of people around him are not going to be the same. Is that true with us? Do we change the people of the lives around us? I'm not sure. On 60 Minutes last week, they had a guy, and I wish I could remember his name, but I can't. All I can remember is he had on pink plaid pants and a different plaid blue jacket. It was like, you know. (laughs) Uh, But anyway, but he's a billionaire, so he can wear whatever he wants, I guess. Anyway, he came, he went to a school that I, I can't even remember, it was at called an academy. It was, an, it was a public school, but the principal had tried to uh, raise the, the consideration of the children that were going there, so they were all highly uh, attuned to their academics and their athletics, and they were, it was in a poor part of South Chicago, so it yeah, wasn't people that were well off or anything, but these kids had high, high test grades. And so they were all very, you know, knowledgeable and everything. But the problem was none of them went to college because they couldn't afford to go to college. They'd all, they'd write letters to colleges because that was part of their academic training. And they would get accepted, but they couldn't go because they couldn't pay. So this guy came in and he had a little announcement for him. And for the kids that were freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors, He paid for their tuition, their living expenses, and their books. So those kids that were even freshmen are still going to go to college. And he had not done it this one time. He has done it four times. But he goes to schools where he knows people can't afford the college, and he does this. And he has a foundation, and he's trying to get more businesses involved in this, and I think that's One of the best things I've ever heard about corporations and capitalism is that they're actually helping the poor. But uh, I I thought that was a great idea to, and I thought of their reaction, they talked to some of them on the show, was kind of the same as the jailers. This is too hard to believe. I get to go to college? And you know, if they said, yeah, we'll pay for your tuition, they'd say, well, I can't afford to live there, I can't afford to buy, books are ridiculous. And so he takes care of it all. So they have absolutely no reason not to go to college. And his point was that because uh, he thinks this is the great divide between the haves and the have-nots is education. That if you have education and it's proven, you get a better job. Even if it's not a job in your area, and not, even if it's not like a high-paying job, you get a better job. There's something about that that's, that is appealing to, pe- to employers because you look like you, you want to try, you want to be there. So that's why he does it. So he announced this to the school, and then he said, but I'm not stopping there. I'm sending all the parents back to school too. So they're all going to night classes and, and doing the thing, and he's paying for babysitting. You know, he's paying for the kids' meals that are staying home. It's very amazing that he's doing all this. I didn't know who he was. I, I didn't have any idea who he was. But because of all this, he wants to make sure that there isn't another reason to have a gap. He's rocking the status quo in so many ways. 
He's disturbing the city. In this case, it's Chicago. And he's disturbing what someone pinned as inadequate peace. And I think that's the way the world is now, inadequate peace. So both the slave girl and the jailer were more than the sum of their ability or their job identity or whatever it is that they did to make money. They are the sum of your faith. You are the sum of your faith. So were Lydia, so was Cornelius. We all are. Now, worship is our time to clarify our values and our motives and to see what we all do and whether we are... Uh, living in the light of the gospel message. So that's why we worship. We praise God for the things that we do have. We give thanks for the things that have happened. We understand that God is our source, and that's what we do in worship. We're here to assess our faith and say, okay, what do I need to do? How do I need to be? We are called to be the light in the gospel message. So the best way for me to, to say this is, how does your light shine in accordance to the gospel message? How do you reflect God's love and grace? So that we can say, Lord, let us be your light until the kingdom comes. Amen. And let's stand and sing, He Lives. You ask me how I know He lives? He lives within my heart. Uh-oh. Serve a risen Savior, He's in the world today. I know that He is living, whatever foes may say.
faith of the United Church of Canada. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. Grant, O God, the gift of your Son, risen and ascended, not just to heaven, but also into our hearts. And through this gift of yours, empower us in our giving that we may be a blessing to others. Take our lives that we may be consecrated to you as we serve our neighbors. Take our hands and let them be moved at your guiding of the, your love. Take our mouths and let them be filled with the good news of Jesus. Amen. As you go out today, remember that you are the light of the word of God, and it is up to us to spread that light and to spread that love. The world needs a lot of love right now. And the 21 candles behind me are for the children and uh, teachers of Uvalde. I was dismayed yesterday when I read a, uh, a Instagram I got. And there were almost a hundred school shootings on there, starting with Thurston, which was right before Columbine. That's too many. And we have to resolve that. And although laws may help one way or the other, what really helps is love. Amen. Amen.